Mother's Day. That is correct. And uh, so I'm going to just uh, invite all of those of you who are not mothers to read off the screen right now. And not many of you who are not mothers. Let's try that again. Everybody, all together, for those of you ready, go. Happy Mother's Day. That's for all the mothers here. And I know I'm going to invite Autumn, by the way, who's got a plan on all this. We're going to have the kids right now bringing some uh, uh, roses to the mothers. And as they come right away, um, I want to just make a quick note. You can start, Autumn. She wants all the mothers to stand. Uh, then, uh, so that's, she's giving me the instructions. Mothers, when we say mothers, we mean literal mother, like my mother there. We also want to include a mother in Israel. This lady in the middle, I was at a 92nd birthday. You can see me in the bottom right there. Linda on the top right, I was there. So all those who are mothers. And this is my teacher from my seventh grade class. She was a mother to me. So whether you have had literal children or not, if you are a mother in any one of those senses, a literal mother, a mother in Israel, a teacher, somebody who has been a guide, somebody who has helped anyone on their path. So we're, the word mother is a broad term, okay? So thank you kids for bringing those roses to the mothers, mothers in Israel. This, by the way, is my seventh grade teacher who inspired me. My sister was, a, was the clever one in the family. I was the dumb one, if you know what I mean. Okay, when you have a sister who does two grades in one year, you know what that means. Yes, she was the two grades in one year sister. So thanks, kids, for bringing those uh, um, gifts to our mothers, literal mothers, mothers in Israel, uh, mothers, people who've had an influence on others. Uh, I appreciate that. And Autumn, thank you for planning this so well. So that... Uh, I am thankful for all the women who have been such an influence. Already this earlier, Sister um, Ronnie shared a poem, and so we'll leave it with that. That, that is your tribute, but uh, we are thankful for mothers in Israel, such as my teacher, or this mother in Israel, the lady there, who when my parents were missionaries to the island of St. Helena, she made sure I had a birthday party. <laughs> so this lady in the center, and I was privileged to be at her 92nd birthday. Or, finally, I'll go back to my own dear mother. Uh, I took a selfie one day at an apartment building, uh, a department store. This was in the big windows, big mirrors, and we took a selfie when she was just about 90 years of age. But uh, we are grateful for mothers. Do I hear an amen? amen. That's right. Thank God for the mothers and the mothers in Israel. Let's pause for prayer. Holy Father, as we today already recognize the blessing of mothers, we pray that you will indeed pour your spirit out on all those, Lord, the women who have been a major positive influence on others in whatever way, teachers, mothers, leaders, mothers in Israel, guide and bless them, especially tomorrow, when uh, we know that they will have breakfast in bed and they will have all kinds of celebrations from their families. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'm going to invite you to uh, take out your study guide because we're going to reflect again on this theme that we're looking at. It's called Fearless of the Future. This is 180 years. This year since 1844, today's topic is the crown of creation. So your study guide is in front of you, and we're going to invite you to just, uh, at the bottom of the study guide, the second last section is what we have on the screen here. We've been trying to get all of us to memorize this, so let's say it together in unison. Are you ready? We have nothing to fear for the future, except as we shall forget the way the Lord has led us and his teaching in our past History. Let's do that one more time. Have it on your study guide. Make sure you can read it from there. Memorize it. I'm hoping by the time we're done with our series, we will all know it very well. Together, we have nothing to fear for the future, except as we shall forget the way the Lord has led us and his teaching in our past history. This is from Life Sketches, page 196, paragraph 2. In case you haven't been with us, whether you're uh, online or uh, watching this later on, for the last two Sabbaths, 
we've been going through a series looking back, fearless of the future. The theme comes out of that beautiful statement we just read that we're hoping to memorize. So we have then challenged ourselves to look back at history and then to accept the challenge to know the roots and grow the fruits. That's the basic challenge we're encouraging all of our members and all of those viewing. And so two Sabbaths ago, we dealt with 1844 and the scriptures. And we notice that the scriptures focus on Jesus. Jesus himself says, these are they which, of course, point to me. Then last week, we dealt with 1844 and the sanctuary message which again, the whole sanctuary message is a focus on Jesus. His ministry right now in the most holy uh, place of the uh, antitypical service there in heaven. Jesus, again, notice, it's Jesus, the center of scripture. Jesus, the center of the sanctuary message. And then today, hmm, what are we going to address? Does anybody recognize that? What is that there? What language is that? Anybody want to guess? Hebrew, that is correct. So I want to keep you in a tiny bit of suspense. And uh, so as we give you a little picture of the background, back in 1831, this gentleman who had graduated with a theology degree, apparently studying to be a minister, theology graduate, started on a tour on a, on a ship sa sailing all the way around the world. From 1831 through 1836, he was on this ship called the HMS Beagle. By now, some of you know who I'm talking about. They did a trip all the way around the world sailing. Who am I talking about? That is correct. Here's a picture as he grew a little older. And if you have a study guide in front of you, this is the first one that you can fill out on your study guide. By July, interesting, notice the date. By July when? 1844. Charles Darwin put those two in there, put in 1844, and then Darwin had written out his theory of evolution. Fascinating. I, I've looked at his autobiography. He actually shares some information. Now, you, you know the, the book was published in 1859, but that's another story. But he had written it out by July and rejected the Bible as inspired. A theology graduate, somebody who should have accepted the Word of God. So this is Charles Darwin, and here is a copy of that, The Origin of Species. And you know what's interesting? Scholars have a title for what they call that. Do you know what they call this? They call this Darwin's 1844 sketch. Interesting. Why 1844? Fascinating. As we go back in history, by the way, History, we often think of human history. I would like to suggest today, history is his story. It's God's leading in spite of the challenges. God's leading, moving towards a culmination point, waking up the world, if you want to use that term. But this is interesting. This is called God, Darwin's 1844 sketch. Look at this interesting statement here. The infidel supposition that the events of the first week, that's the next word for your study guide, I've got that statement there for you, required indefinite periods, millions or billions of years, for their accomplishment strikes directly at the foundation of the what? of the Sabbath. This is from a book called Spiritual Gifts, volume 3, page 91. It's on your study guide, so you can go back, you can read it further, you can Google for the book, and you can actually read the whole statement in context. Interesting. So what is this whole concept of indefinite periods? It's what we call macroevolution, the theory that everything just evolved on its own. And it's interesting, there's a historian, now he's passed away. He served at Southern Adventist University some years ago. His name was Dr. Jerome Clark. He put it this way. Historian Dr. Clark noted, carried to, I'm quoting now, its ultimate conclusion, evolution, what? Destroys the Sabbath. Interesting. Now, it's very sad a fact I learned a few years ago that there are some fellow Christians who celebrate uh, a special Sunday, Evolution Sunday. Amazing. And that is correct. That's what Dr. Clark was pointing out. Now, it not only destroys the Sabbath. It's interesting. If we don't believe in the story of creation, let's say uh, Eve being tempted 
uh, by the serpent there. If we don't believe in the creation story, think about the implications of this. Think about this. If there is no creation, then there's no sin, correct? If there's no sin, there's no Savior needed, and ultimately no second coming. Ultimately, what is left of the scriptural stories and the doctrines and the teachings? So this whole issue of no creation or evolution doesn't only strike at the heart of the Sabbath, it really undermines the need of a Savior. It affects many biblical beliefs. Thank God, back in the 1840s, there were some who were concerned, such as, and here's a picture, of an ancient church, I use the word ancient, about 150 years ago or so. But a group of people had come to this country, and in, in 1671, 1671, they were established here. They were called Seventh-day Baptists. And concerned over the threat of new Sunday laws, Seventh-day Baptists set a day of fasting and prayer. This is on your study guide. November 1, 1843, and again in 1844, that God would arise and plead for His Holy Sabbath. Now notice the timing here. November 1, 1843. That was less than a year before October 22, 1844. Notice, it was within that actual literal year that the Baptists, not knowing about October 22, in fact, no Millerites even knew about October 22 at that point in time, but already they felt impressed by God. From November 1, they set a date for November 1, and again in 1844, asking that God would bless and rise up people to, to plead for his holy Sabbath. By the way, they sent the appeal out to other Baptists, Sunday-keeping Baptists. They sent out the appeal on the, for this. Now, they were Seventh-day Baptists. Don't miss that. In, in this series, I've mentioned we've had a Baptist, William Miller, the farmer. We mentioned Josiah Litch, the Methodist. We mentioned last week a Messianic Jew by the name of uh, Wolf was his first name, and how he went around the world proclaiming the second coming of Jesus. You'll notice many different people from different denominations that we as Seventh-day Adventists are thankful for, for highlighting things. Well, while the fact was that the, the Baptist churches were not interested, and incidentally, the Millerites were not interested as a group, their focus was on the coming of Jesus as they understood it, and we showed you last week as they misunderstood it because they had included one or two non-biblical ideas into their beliefs. But it's interesting, in early 1844, while visiting her daughter in New Hampshire, a New York Sabbath-keeping lady, she was a uh, Seventh-day Baptist, went to a Sunday church. By the way, she knew there were no Baptist, uh, there were no Sabbath-keeping churches, so she went to the Sunday-keeping church. Okay? He, this was of a Methodist Millerite preacher on Communion Sunday. The pastor stated, quote, all who confess communion with Christ in such a service as this should be ready to obey God and keep His commandments in all things. When the pastor came to visit later, this lady challenged him to keep all of God's commandments, including the fourth. He studied, accepted, and started preaching it in March 1844. I know you're wondering who the lady is. Yes, here's her picture. You notice just God working through one lady. Her name was Rachel Oaks. Put down the name O-A-K-S, I used to spell it O-A-K-E-S, and I found it, there's no E in the word, just found that out recently. So Rachel Oaks, O-A-K-S, a Seventh-day Adventist woman who, by the way, she wanted to stand up in the church service and tell the pastor, you better sit down, but she held her peace. She was wise, and when he came to visit, he, she talked to him privately. And uh, he listened, he studied the Word of God, and so, and who is this preacher? Here is a picture of him. His name is Frederick Wheeler, this Millerite preacher. And you know what's interesting? He began to keep the Sabbath. Uh, he studied it, and by March he was keeping the Sabbath. And there were 60, 60 people in his congregation who were looking forward to the coming of Jesus. And of the 60, 40 of them, two-thirds, accepted the Sabbath message. 
And as a result, they became the first SKAs. And no one, anybody knows was an SKA. We know what an SDA, Seventh-day Adventist, an SDB, Seventh-day Baptist. What's an SKA? A Sabbath-keeping Adventist, right? There was no denomination, so they joined it. And James White, by the way, described this church as, quote, the place where Sabbath-keeping was first practiced by Adventists. Interesting. Now, you think about it. Here it was. God worked through one lady who was willing to share her faith. Now, in the meantime, by the way, uh, um, this Frederick Wheeler was now preaching it for a march. Another preacher, a Millerite preacher, who was a Baptist, heard about this. And he, in August, right at the time that the Samuel Snow and others were beginning to proclaim, get ready for October 22, this Baptist preacher, his name was Thomas Preble, put his name down there, in August 1844, point number four now, Thomas Preble, he's a Millerite, accepted the Sabbath. And then a few months later, after October 22, 1844, he sat down and he wrote up his findings. Now notice, it all started with one lady, Rachel Oaks, right? In the sense, yes, true, the people were praying, most important. The Seventh-day Baptists were praying that God would arise and plead for his Holy Sabbath. And in pressing Rachel Oaks, she then privately talked to Frederick Wheeler. Frederick Wheeler taught it to his congregation. They started keeping the Sabbath. And then, of course, along comes Thomas Preble, who finds out about what Wheeler was doing. <laughs> and Thomas Preble sits down and he writes it up. And guess who reads what Thomas Preble did? A man by the name of Joseph Bates, the sea captain. So we're number five. You notice the ripple effect. Are you following this? From one lady being willing to share her faith with a preacher who, by the way, didn't know everything, and the preacher was willing to listen and go back to the Word of God, from Rachel Oaks, through Wheeler, through Thomas Preble, through Joseph Bates. And Joseph Bates then made this a lifelong, part of his lifelong emphasis. He wrote tracts. That's what we call it today, or small books. And this is how the Seventh-day Sabbath became accepted. I know some of you are going to say, but you didn't mention this gentleman. Anybody recognize him? The well-known John Nevins Andrews. Yes, John Nevins Andrews, after whom Andrews University has been named. Barely 16 years of age when he accepted the Sabbath in 1845. This is the same time that Joseph Bates accepted, 1845. Okay. And he became Seventh-day Adventist's most foremost Sabbath scholar. What do we mean by that? He wrote an incredible book that's uh, called History of the Sabbath and First Day of the Week. This is the second edition in 1873. But the focus of our messages here is 1840s. So I didn't really want to talk much about Andrews. It took him, what, close to 30 years to get this book written. And by the way, part of the reason, he was a real perfectionist. And there was a lady that said to him, don't try to write the perfect book. Get it out. Let people know. You know who that lady was, right? <laughs> Ellen White. She said, get it out so people can read the content. And if you need to improve, do it later on. But Andrews was quite a perfectionist. He was a scholar, as, as you may have heard. He knew something like seven languages. He was our first official missionary to Europe. Just last year, I had the opportunity a couple times to go to his grave marker in Basel, Switzerland. So John Nevins Andrews, but it was about 30 years after he accepted the Sabbath that he began to write. And I am thankful that God has blessed us through the Baptist, through the Methodist, through Rachel Oaks, the Seventh-day Baptist, through uh, Joseph Bates. He was from the Christian Connection. Are you following the point I'm making here? Different people from different denominations studying the Word of God, all coming together to promote the keeping of this day. But we want to go back to the beginning. Read with me now from the scriptures. Ready? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. You see, the story of the Sabbath, unfortunately, some people have concluded that it's, we go to the Ten Commandments. Adventists do not do that. Adventists know we have to go back to the beginning. Because we start with God the Creator, all right? And as we read in the book of Genesis, we want to make sure that people know we believe God is Creator and the Bible's account is trustworthy. We believe the Word of God. We trust the Word of God. We f uh, base our faith firmly on this foundation, the Word of God. 
Now, that's chapter one. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Put that word trustworthy in your study guide there. And my apology, I normally start by reminding all of you to uh, <clears throat> turn this text off to, so we can focus on this text. And I didn't do that this morning. Somebody forgot. I think I heard a cell phone ring. So make sure you turn uh, this text off, turn your cell phone off, so we can follow on this text in Scripture. Okay, and that's chapter one. Put the word trustworthy in. Now, we go to chapter two. And I want us to read that together. Beautiful scripture to remind us as to why we keep the Sabbath. Are you ready? Thus the heavens and the earth were finished and all the host of them. Next verse. And on the seventh day, God ended his work which he had done. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had done. And finally, verse 3, then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because in it he rested from all his work which God had created and made. By the way, I want you to notice something here, and we don't have time to go into it, but notice the language here, rested from. Rested from. It's an interesting concept. What does that mean? Simply says, when the, when the lawyer says, I rest my case, he means what? He's finished. That's right. He's finished. And the term is rested from. Please don't think the word Sabbath means rest. It actually means rest from. It means stop. It means cease. Interesting. And I mentioned that before. If you want to look at the, seven, the book called Seven Day Adventists Believe, what we have promoted, the Ministerial Association did it. More than 200 people from around the world contributed to get that book done. It correctly says the word Shabbat in Hebrew means stop, cease. It doesn't mean rest. Why do I say that? Because too many times we think Sabbath is a time to go lie down and get that kind of lay activities. That's not what it means. All right? It means to stop your weekly activities, your worldly actions, to focus fully upon God and His grace. Cessation, stoppage. In fact, one time I was in Canada, just thought, thought of it, and I was in a Sabbath school panel, and I mentioned that. And thankfully, there was a, the pastor was from an Eastern European country. And he said, you're right, in my language, where I'm from, when people would go on strike, refusing to work, you know what they called them? All those who were on strike, they called them Shabbatniks. People who refuse to work. Are you get it? So we are all what? Shabbatniks. <laughs> we don't work on the Sabbath. All right. So let's go to capital B now. The six days are literal, in your study guide, historical, natural, 24 hour, there's a hyphenated word there, 24 and then hyphen hour, days like now. This is important just to remind us why, because unfortunately there are some people who say, we don't know how long was the day that God created. Was it a thousand years? Was it a million years? That day. No, no. If you look at scripture, it's a 24 hour day like now. So put the word 24 hour in. Uh, sadly, <clears throat> there have been some who have arisen within our own denomination who uh, are drifting away from this biblical belief. Um, I was in a meeting once when I saw and heard a man say something. When push comes to shove, he said, I go with the scientists. And what was more shocking is that he had studied theology. He had taught theology. And then I came up with a new word. I concluded, now you notice I'm not giving his name because I'm not attacking people, but I concluded that he is not a theologian, He's an anthropologian. You won't find that word in the dictionary. <laughs> I made it up. <laughs> an anthropologian is one who follows the words of humans. We have to be theologians following the word of God. Okay. We remember artist's uh, impression here of Moses receiving the Ten Commandments. And when I was growing up as a child, one of the favorite things we did was to repeat Exodus chapter 20, verses 8 through 11. Now, I don't know if you, if you learned it. I'm putting it up on the New King James Version, but it was one of my favorites. So if you would indulge me, read with me from the screen so we can read together this beautiful passage from the Ten Commandments. Ready? Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. 
But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work. You, nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them and rested the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Now I'm going to pause right here and say, you know, the series we're doing is a brief overview of the growth and the development of the beliefs of the Seventh Adventist Church. That's why we were covering, of course, the scriptures. We've covered the sanctuary, the unique mass message. But if anybody asks who are Seventh Day Adventists, almost Always, the first thing they'll say, oh, those are the people who go to church on Saturday. Isn't that right? Yeah. All right? <laughs> That's almost always the first. Now, I mean, if you're in this area, they may say, oh, those are the people of the blue zones. <laughs> okay, they may say that, focusing on the health message. But the Sabbath is the most well-known one of all. And so this reminds me of the importance. And incidentally, some of the words at the top there, uh, there are words that are fascinating, especially in the context of the major thrust of the Seventh Avenue Church is the three angels' message, messages. And right up here, where it talks about the heavens and the earth, the sea and all, that phrase, and I went and double checked it one day. There are six words, word for word, quoted from this into the first angels' message. This is in the book of Revelation. It's the only direct quotation from the entire Old Testament in the book of Revelation that we know of. Just, and where does it come from? When it says, worship him. It's worship him who made the heavens and the earth and the sea. It's an interesting connection how the three angels' messages, the first one focuses on worshiping God and it's a focus of reminding us it's the seventh day Sabbath. Interesting connection between the three angels' messages and of course the seventh day Sabbath. Let's move on to our capital C now, Exodus 20. We just read that. Sabbath is a memorial. Put that word in. I know it's a large word, especially for the kids. I'm thankful for parents helping their children write this out. But it's a memorial. It's a reminder. It's a, some have done this. They call it the birthday of the world. <laughs> At the end of the week, I was at an evangelistic series working with an Australian evangelist some years ago, decades ago, and that's the idea. When he talked about the Sabbath, he actually had them bake a real birthday cake to celebrate the Sabbath, an actual celebration, a memorial, okay? So that's capital C as we review and reflect. Uh, of course, our focus is history, but we want to remind you of some biblical facts as well. Let's go now to little one. The Sabbath was sanctified in Eden. We read that on our screen already, Genesis chapter 2, verse 3. The Sabbath was sanctified in Eden by God for all humans. Please do, write the word humans in there. This we find in Mark chapter 2, verse 27, where Jesus says the Sabbath was made in the uh, wider phraseology. The Sabbath was made for the benefit of humans and not humans for the benefit of the Sabbath. The Sabbath was made for humans, the very words of Jesus here. Uh, a very important reflection. Incidentally, down the road, by God's grace, once we're done with this series of historical reflections for 1844, since 180 years, since that important time, we will take more time to dig deeper, reflect more upon topics such as the Sabbath, because this is a forgotten truth that we really need to share with others. And incidentally, if you didn't know it, there are various Christian groups, including mainly researchers who are studying the topic. I have in my own library, which hopefully will get you when Linda arrives towards the end of next month, I believe, probably 10 to 15 books written by non-Adventists about the Sabbath. Did you hear that? More than a dozen books, and I've been reading them. And they all are coming to the conclusion, listen carefully, that God intentionally, for our health, mental, physical, social, emotional, for our health and wellness, spiritual, God set aside 24 hours of rest for us. It's amazing how others are coming to that conclusion. The only difference is, the only difference is, they say it doesn't matter which day you take off. That's the only difference. So, but they are on the right track. Are you with me? 
They're moving in the recognition that there's a 24-hour need that we have. And we'll talk more about this in the future. But let's continue now. Jesus showed how to keep the Sabbath holy. Write the word down, holy. And uh, this is Luke chapter 4, verse 16, our favorite passage we often use as Adventists. And it came about as his custom was. He went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and he stood up to read. You know that text so well, right? We've used that many times to encourage people to keep the Sabbath. Then in John chapter 5, John chapter 9, etc., there's more evidence of how to enjoy keeping this day in holy. Uh, and and here's some. Uh, if you don't mind, I tell people sometimes, pull your feet in. I don't want to step on your toes. <laughs> because here's another statement that may do that right now. I, I like to alert people ahead of time, okay? Especially on fellowship meal. Otherwise, you'll catch me at the, at the potluck later on, Pastor. And I said, okay, ah, now listen carefully. Let not the precious hours of the Sabbath be wasted in bed. On Sabbath morning, the family should be astir early. If they rise late, there is confusion and bustle and preparing for breakfast and Sabbath school. There is hurrying, jostling, and impatience. Thus, unholy feelings come into the home. The Sabbath, thus desecrated, becomes a weariness, and its coming is dreaded rather than loved. This is from Testimonies, Volume 6, page 357, paragraph 1. You may want to write it on the back of your sheet there. 6357. 6357, paragraph 1. By the way, I didn't say that, I just read it. All right? 6357, paragraph 1. And perhaps, perhaps, friends, you had an exhausting week. I'm not going to ask a show of hands. But I know how it was and it has been sometimes in my life. Because you see, a short story here. Kids, are you ready? I promise at least two stories every Sabbath. So if the kids are ready, this is for them. And not just for the kids, it's for the adults too. How many of you have ever played the game called Bible Charades? Let me see your hands. Anyone here? Not many. You've missed out, folks. Bible Charades, especially with kids, all right? And so a few years ago, decades ago, my wife and I became instant parents. You've heard of instant coffee, instant lawn. Well, Linda and I became instant parents, meaning my sister-in-law moved in with her two boys, five years of age and seven years of age, and their father had died. So guess who became daddy? All right? And so I was working very hard. I was what they call a self-sponsored student at Andrews University. And when Sabbath came, I had barely enough to stay awake through church. Oh, you know what I'm talking about? Anybody here? Right? Okay, you're exhausted. But of course, I, I'm, I'm instant father. So I remember that Sabbath when one of the kids said, Uncle Ron, let's play some Bible charades. And I thought, oh, this is after lunch. I was just planning to do, and do some wonderful lay activities. And you know what I mean by that, right? I'm talking about the wrong kind of lay activities. Come, Uncle Ron, please. And of course, I knew their father had died, and I wanted to be a positive influence in their life. And I thought, okay, okay. And I'm thinking, now, what am I going to do? Oh, by the way, Bible charades, here's a picture, for example. Uh, you know, this guy is acting out a Bible story, and the other five are to guess. And so it, they went around the circle, and they came to my, side, my place, my turn, and I went to lie down on my stomach completely. Just lie down there and do nothing. Just while I was laying there, what? Act. I am acting. And they guessed and they guessed and guessed and eventually they got it. I was Lazarus in the tomb. <laughs> and they went around the circle again and they came to me. And the next time I was lying down with my hand on my head and I was just lying there doing nothing. And they tried and they tried. And eventually one of them ah, Goliath, after he got hit with that rock in the chair. Yes, and so, I, uh, confession, folks, I've never told the kids this, okay? They're grown men now, but I thought of every story in the Bible where people were lying down doing nothing. <laughs> now you laugh, but that's very, I'm embarrassed to tell you that because what was I doing at Andrews? I was studying to be a pastor, to be a theologian, to be, and here I was working until I had nothing left for God on Sabbath. 
Thank God for his forgiving grace, isn't it? God is so good. The kids never knew why I was all these characters, and they enjoyed the Sabbath. Early Christians, Jew and Gentile, kept the Sabbath. The next one in your study guide, put the word Christians in. Unfortunately, many people don't realize it. Many folk, sincere Christians, think it was the Jews who kept the Sabbath only. No, it wasn't just the Jews. It was Jews and Gentiles. There are enough Bible texts that can share, show that. But Jews and Gentiles kept the Sabbath and enjoyed this 24 hours, as one person has called it, a palace in time. A time with our best friend Jesus and with our family, with our friends, with fellow Fellowship in church. That's right. Okay. Christians. Put the word down. Once you've got that word Christians, let's go to the next one. Okay. Item number four. Jesus said what? Read it with me. If you love me, keep my commandments. Put that word. I've given you this text before, but I want to remind you of that. It's a matter of a love relationship. Remember I shared with you a few Sabbaths ago that people say, you're legalists. And I said, well, only two letters they missed, messed up. It's not L E G. A-L-I-S-D-S. It's L-O-Y-A-L-I-S-D-S. Do you remember that? We're not legalists. We're what? Loyalists. Loyalists. That's right. Because we love the Lord, we want to keep that Sabbath. Out of love for Him. All right? And of course, the good news is, capital D, Isaiah 66, verse 23, the Sabbath will be kept in the new earth. Put the word earth in your study guide. The Sabbath will be kept in the new earth from one Sabbath to another, and it's from one month to another that uh, all flesh will gather before the Lord. So the word earth is important there, and we look forward to that. And of course, thankfully in Isaiah chapter 58, verse 13, also it's not in your study guide, but you, you know the verse well. It says, call the Sabbath what? A delight. In fact, somebody said this is the only plain time when there's a nickname given to, a, <laughs> to something. Call the Sabbath delight. It's an unusual word. And I've got to confess, go back to me looking after Danny and Patrick, my, two, my wife's two nephews. When we were done with our meal on Sabbath, not only let's play some Bible charades in Michigan winter, for example, Okay, but there were times when the weather was good. I remember Danny loved animals. In fact, he was fearless. He would pick up snakes. He would pet monkeys. I took him with me to Zimbabwe once. He was just a fearless kid. And I remember one day he said, Uncle Ron, Uncle Ron, let's go down to the dairy. Now, I'll admit, folks, I don't like going to the dairy farm, especially after lunch. Anybody been to a dairy? You know what I'm talking about? And, and to go there after lunch, you've just enjoyed the wonderful aromas of the meal cooked by your wife. Linda, my wife, is just an excellent cook, by the way. And, and so then you go down to the dairy where they're going to milk the cows. And the cows don't worry about the fact that I just had a delicious lunch. But the kids wanted to go. And so we would go to the dairy. And, of course, they would pet the dirty animals and whatever they could do, pick up the stray cat. Uh, but the kids loved it. And we would go down to the dairy at Andrews. Andrews used to have a dairy farm for many decades. And then after that, we'd jump on our bicycles and we'd cycle down a road that was almost like this road. Cycle down the road. There was a river there. And we would literally stop and pick uh, mulberries off there, which would be our dessert or addition to dessert. And I'll tell you, the, folk, the kids just loved Sabbaths. In fact, there was a house opposite that became vacant. And, and their mom wanted them to move there. And they didn't want to move. And they said, why don't you want to move? They said, no, we, we don't want to go there because we won't have family worships. And I, when I heard that, I said, praise God. The kids wanted to be where they could spend time with Jesus. Make sure the Sabbath is a what? Delight. And incidentally, just today, Matt and I were talking, and I said, we've got to have another hike. I said, at fellowship meal, let's talk together, Matt, and I hope Eric is here. If not, we're going to talk Matt and Richie. Uh, by the way, I call him Richie just to differentiate between the man two rows in front, Richard, okay? And he's given me permission <clears throat> because his family calls him Richie. So Richie and Matt, uh, we're going to get together, and we're going to talk about when we'll have our next outdoor hike. We went in April. I'll, I'd like to have one every month if possible. Go out into nature. And I've, Matt will also be able to share with us some of the important and interesting things about nature. I've, Matt has shared with me some of the things he's learned and he, over time. And Matt's got a lot to share with us so we can go and enjoy God's second book. 
The first book is the Bible. The second book is nature. That's right. We've got to go out and enjoy it, spending time. Had the Sabbath been universally kept, man's thoughts and affections would have been led to the Creator as the object of reverence and worship. And there would never have been an idolater, an atheist. The keeping of the Sabbath is a sign of loyalty. I told you we're loyalists to the true God, him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. Great controversy, 437 paragraph two. I put it on your study guide. You didn't have to fill anything in on this one. It's right there and so forth. So I want to make sure you can take this home with you. It's amazing this truth was rediscovered when? In 1844. Now, if you notice what's happening, as you look back at history, in fact, uh, Dr. Jerome Clark, the late uh, historian from Southern, actually has three books. They are all called 1844. Three entire books. 1844. I didn't know about it until I was speaking on the topic one day and somebody said, did you know? And so I have his volume one, volume two, volume three. Three entire books called 1844. There was so much happening in the world at 1844. Why? Well, we don't know for sure, except we know that there was a major religious movement arising and there were counter movements on the other side. Are you with me? And we know who's the one behind all the counterfeits, the devil himself. And so friends, as we round off our message here today, don't you look forward to heaven, the new earth, time to spend, with our, spend time with our best friend, Jesus Christ. After a thousand years in heaven, a millennium, coming back to this earth, but I would like to encourage you, because I don't want us to just go there ourselves. There are many out there who don't know this beautiful message. Yesterday afternoon, I was uh, walking, and uh, I came across a lady. She was walking very slowly. Uh, this was at Sun Lakes, where I live. So I, I said something to her, just greeted her briefly, and we ended up talking for maybe an hour and as we talked, she said, I go to a Bible study, da, 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 and we talked more and more. And then she said, and God got me out of this. And I realized she was open to spiritual things. We kept talking. And by the time we were done, I gave her my business card. I talked with her. I had an opportunity to pray with her. 92-year-old lady. Just, you know, God opens doors. But I want to challenge you, all of us, to know the roots that the seven-day Sabbath is God's special gift to everyone and grow the fruits, tell others joyfully. And so by the, within the first five or ten minutes, this lady actually teased me, kind of surprised me. You know, you don't tease somebody you just met. <laughs> and she teased me and I said, I, I, I didn't get the joke because she was really being mischievous. And then I realized that I said, hey, you just teased me. She said, yes, I do. I, I did. I'm a teaser. I said, okay. And so I said, good, we're friends then. <laughs> and that opened the door. <laughs> and uh, after opening the door, God gave me the chance to talk with her, encourage her, to pray with her. And she even said to me, Th this, thank you. This has been such, it was just around noon. This Friday morning is a wonderful morning. I rarely get out. But God will give you opportunities to tell others to share with them the beautiful truths, including the one about the Sabbath, as we're going to sing now, Don't Forget the Sabbath. This is our hymn of consecration, and by God's grace, as we sing this hymn, may we sing it as a prayer that we don't want to forget this special day. Stand with me now as we sing number 388.
disciple. I am the living way. And if we meekly follow our Savior here below, He'll give us of the fountain with streams eternal. It's golden hours we'll spend in thankful hymns to Jesus, the children's dearest friend. Oh, gentle, loving Savior, how good and kind Lord, how precious is thy promise to dwell in it. Holy Father, thank you for this special 24 hours that you have set aside, sanctified, so that we can spend our time with our Savior, Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord, for this day that we've been blessed with. And may we enjoy it as a delight. May we make it special, especially for the kids. And may we go out to tell others about this special time with Jesus. And now the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Amen.